a teenager, I waited tables in a local restaurant to pay for the gas for my car. I met Mr. Creep there. In my naive mind, he seemed normal at first, despite the fact that he was 20 and wanting to date a 17-year-old. Leaving my job after dark scared me, so I taught myself to get in my car, shut the door, and lock it in one fluid motion. It made me feel safe. One night, I was leaving work and had just gotten into my car when Mr. Creep seemed to just appear out of nowhere, yanking my door handle to try to open it. I looked into his eyes in the split second before he smiled, and what I saw absolutely chilled my bones. I don't know how to describe the evil I saw. From then on, I was terrified of him, but I didn't let on because I was afraid of what he might do if I told him I never wanted to see him again. After this, he constantly lied to try to impress me and tried to invent ways of being alone with me, but my instinct was to run, so I avoided him. About two weeks after this incident, the restaurant got robbed, and there was significant evidence against Mr. Creep, just not the kind that allowed the cops to charge him. I sent all of my text conversations with Mr. Creep to the police chief in hopes it would help. Mr. Creep slithered away after that, but I always looked over my shoulder. About five years ago, he messaged me on Facebook out of the blue. He went on about his top-secret military clearance, as well as a huge acreage he owed. I felt like he was trying to spring a trap or something, but I tried to put it out of my mind. Then, today, I was looking at posts about an unsolved murder when I saw his mugshot. He is now facing murder charges as well as two other violent felony charges. I am glad to know he's locked up but so overwhelmed about how correct my instincts about Mr. Creep were. I escaped him. That's what I think, at least. When I was 18 and newly graduated, I ran into some issues with my attempts to enroll in college and also had a hard time finding a job in my area in the meantime, which led to me having to sign on at the job center. They determined that I was too shy to succeed in interviews and placed me in a group that was supposed to teach interview skills in order to fix that. The group ended up ultimately being a complete waste of time. I honestly think they put me in the wrong group or just needed an extra member and made an excuse to throw me in to make up the numbers, but that's not really relevant to the story. And the other group members didn't do much to help with my shyness, either since they were all men who at least four decades older than me and obviously didn't share any of my interests. Unfortunately, I ended up gaining the attention of the one member I wanted nothing to do with. I don't actually remember the man's name at this point, but I think it was something generic like John, so that's what I'll call him. John immediately got off on the wrong foot with the rest of the group when he interrupted the instructor during their introduction to the course, to complain that him being there was useless since he would be retiring in a few years anyways, and no one wanted to hire someone who had spent over ten years in prison. When that didn't get him the reaction he wanted, I assume the rest of the group thought he was just attention. Seeking and the instructor had heard similar things before from people who weren't happy about being in the course. He waited until we had been given paperwork to complete, and then turned to the man next to him and loudly explained his prison sentence was for beating his ex-wife, but that she was a lying and he never put a hand on her. She didn't even have any bruises on her at the trial or any evidence of bruises or other injuries before that either, but because she was a woman... The judge automatically believed her and sent him to jail. This immediately set me on edge. I'm not an expert when it comes to the law, but I do watch true crime channels on YouTube and I have never heard of a sentence of over 10 years. For a single beating that supposedly never even happened didn't leave visible injuries. Either John was lying and had severely beaten his wife to the point of putting her in the hospital, or he had been arrested on other charges and was covering up what he actually went to prison for. I immediately decided I wanted nothing to do with him regardless of which one it was, and would avoid interacting with him as much as possible outside of polite hellos and passing him things if asked. Like I said before, I didn't really interact much with the other members of the group at all because of their ages. 
I attended the first half of the meeting in the morning, spent the dinner break in the library while the men all snuck off to the pub, and then went home immediately after the second half was over. No one ever asked me how I had spent my breaks, and since the pub and library were in opposite directions from each other, and couldn't be seen from the front of the building, the group met in because of the way the streets were arranged. There should have been no way for any of them to know where I had been, which made what happened next even more worrying. About halfway through the course, there was a day where I had bumped into a friend on my dinner break and decided to put off visiting the library until the course was over for the day to catch up with them instead, when I did get around to it. I spent at least quarter of an hour there before heading to the desk to check out my books and ended up being drawn into a conversation by the librarian who had noticed I was checking out books related to a franchise. He also enjoyed, and that was getting a new movie the next year. There were only a handful of other people in the library, so I didn't see anything wrong with talking to a friendly man around my age who shared my interests after eight hours of boredom and paperwork. We had been talking for another quarter of an hour when he suddenly glanced over my shoulder, looking confused and concerned, and was just opening his mouth to say something when someone grabbed me by my shoulders. My friends and family know that I hate having my shoulders touched without warning, and would never have done that to me, so I immediately knew that whoever was touching me was a stranger and knocked their hands away while turning around and backing up into the librarian's desk. It was John. He was standing directly behind me with a huge smile on his face, and as soon as I turned around, he made a joke about knowing he would find me there and how I practically lived there before chattering at me as if we were close friends. I was just completely confused. It was obvious that he hadn't just coincidentally bumped into me from the way he was talking, but John had been kept behind while the group was heading out because he had filled out his paperwork incorrectly. And as I mentioned before, you can't see the library from the building, so he shouldn't. Any way of seeing where I had gone. It had also been half an hour since I left the building, so if he had left not long after me and just seen me go in while we were walking in the same direction, he would have come inside by then. The only way it made sense for him to know to look for me there and joke that I practically lived there would be if he had somehow learned I was going to the library during dinner breaks known I hadn't that day and guessed I would go after the meeting instead. What made that even stranger than it already was is the fact that John had never shown any interest in me during the group sessions, and mostly ignored me the way I ignored him unless we were forced to interact for whatever reason. So why was he now following me into other buildings to start? Conversations out of nowhere and acting like we were close. While John was still talking, the librarian leaned in to ask if I knew the man because he had obviously seen my negative reaction to being touched by John, and when I briefly explained the situation to him, he asked John politely to please leave me alone or leave the building. John refused and tried to tell the man that we were friends, completely ignoring the fact that I had just said we weren't and how ridiculous it would be to claim 18-year-old girl and in 50, 60 something your old man were friends in the first place. When the librarian asked again and outright told him that harassing other customers wasn't acceptable and he would be removed from the building if he refused to leave me alone, John smiled and agreed to leave in a tone that you use when humoring a child before walking out and very obviously stationing himself right outside the doors waiting for me to leave too. The librarian was clearly concerned by this and asked for the full story of what was going on, and I told him, including my suspicions that John had been following me around without my knowledge to know I would be there in the first place. He suggested I should stay in the library until his break so he could walk me to my bus stop to make sure John left me alone, but it would be several hours, and if I had waited, I wouldn't have gotten home in time to change and head to another meeting. I had later that evening, so he asked me to at least come in the next time I was there to let him know I was safe and reluctantly watched me leave. John immediately stepped into my personal space when I got outside, jokingly asking what the librarian's problem was and still acting like we were friends. 
I tried to walk around him without answering him and head to the bus station to go home, but he grabbed me by my arm and reminded me that there was a closer stop for our bus. When I told him that we aren't getting the same bus because I had never seen him on the same one as me, he corrected me that we both needed the bus and told me where he lived, which was in fact on the same bus route as me. Although I was still tempted to walk away and go to the station instead, and possibly sneakily get on a different bus and just walk the rest of the walk home. It was very clear he was going to follow me if I did, because he still had a hold of my arm, refusing to let go when I tried to pull away, and there were several dark alleys on the way that I had no intention of going anywhere near while in his company. When I agreed to go to the closer bus stop, he let go of me and started walking at my side, chattering like we were good friends again. John kept walking when we reached the stop, which was odd, but I was hoping that my lack of response to anything he said had made him give up and decide to leave me alone, or that he had mixed up that stop with one further along, and I could run while his back was turned. No luck. As soon as he realized I wasn't following him anymore, John came back, frowning as if he was confused and asking me. I thought we were going for coffee together. Shocked, I told him bluntly. No. He kept pushing, trying to convince me that I had agreed to go with him, and when that didn't work, he switched tactics and claimed I had mentioned while leaving the classroom that I wanted some coffee, so he thought we could go together. That was an obvious lie, too, since I don't drink coffee and told him so. John's only answer was to say I didn't have to get coffee and keep pushing me to go to a cafe with him. I firmly told him no and apparently he took that as me not wanting to drink in public because he attempted to invite me to his flat. But that wasn't weird enough. He started telling me that if there is a naked girl on the couch when we get there, I'm not to worry because that's his 18-year-old daughter. Because an 18-year-old is definitely going to lounge around naked on her father's furniture in front of him. Right. Other people at the stop were staring at us now, and I took the opportunity to point out that I was also 18 and firmly tell John that I don't want to go to his flat with him and to leave me alone. He completely ignored the last part and tried to claim I was lying about my age and was at least 29 when most people at the time still mistook me for being in my early teens at first glance. The bus arrived at that moment and I got on as quickly as possible, thinking I would be safe there and the driver would throw him off if need be. No, when I sat in an aisle seat to stop John sitting next to me, he physically shoved me across the seat, penning me in against the window to the point I could barely move and pressing his knees up against the seat in front of him to make sure I had no room to get past him unless he allowed it. The only way for me to get out would have involved me straddling his lap since the seats in front of us were occupied. I loudly told him to move and to leave me alone, but he ignored me and continued trying to convince me to come to his flat, and although a few people gave me uncomfortable looks when I tried to make eye contact with some of the men in the hopes they would help, they would look away as if they hadn't noticed or suddenly become very interested in their phones. I spent the ride huddled against the window, trying to touch him as little as possible, and was ignored again when I shouted at him to stop touching me, because he kept putting his hand on my thigh, as high up as he could get without directly groping me. No one did anything about it, but he stopped touching me after that. He had apparently also given up on convincing me to go to his flat that day, but when we were coming up to the apartment block, he pointed it out to me physically turning my face when I refused to look, told me his apartment number and tried to give me a kiss goodbye on the cheek, which I dodged before getting off the bus and knocking on the opposite window to try and get my attention so he could wave at me. When the bus set off again, several people started loudly talking about how disgusting he was and that men like him should be reported while refusing to look in my direction where I was sat shaking and seething in my seat. Other than an awkward, or so, are you all right? From the driver, just as I was about to step off the bus, no one bothered to check on me. As soon as I got home, I sent an email to the instructor, telling her that I wanted to switch groups and never see the man, explaining what he had done. She read it, but ignored it for an entire week until I sent a follow-up. 
threatening to get the police involved if they forced me to interact with the man again, and their solution was to tell me I could leave the course early instead, essentially kicking me out as if I was the problem. I bumped into the man not long afterwards, and he tried to ask me why I hadn't been attending the group anymore, admitting that he had asked the instructor and they had refused to tell him, but I managed to get away and lose him in the crowd. I've seen him a few times in passing in the years since, but fortunately he has never noticed me or approached me again, and I hope it stays that way.